Thank you for coming. I mean, what what a treat. I mean, uh, James has been in a in over a hundred and ninety six movies. And I look it. <laughs> Five thousand plus television <laughs> commercials. It's tiring, very tiring. That's why I look so old. <laughs> <laughs> so some of, some of the other movies he's been in: uh, Pursuit of Happiness, All My Children, Mulholland Drive, Wall Street, The China Syndrome, Poltergeist, where he got into similar trouble, uh, and of course our beloved Return of the Living Dead. Uh, amongst all of those movies he worked on. He uh, won a Saturn Award from the Academy of Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Horror, and also the Buster Award ah. from the Buster Keaton Society because he demonstrated professional excellence in the tradition of Buster Keaton, which was the wonderful actor that you saw in the beginning. Wasn't that great, Cops? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it was very early. That was about 1921, wasn't it? Uh, I think so, yeah. as I recall. That's one of his first pictures that he made by himself he had been working with the uh, with Fatty Arbuckle and uh, then he branched off on him as his own amazing amazing now how did you come to did you seek out Buster Keaton yeah he was you? my idol as a child and I always wanted to work with him and uh, I was producing in summer stock and I decided I would see if I could get him to be in a summer stock play and he was very happy to work he loved working he worked almost every day of his life oh he never stopped working he couldn't and what year was this that you, you 1957 met remember that year everybody good year wasn't i was it? one year old <laughs> My goodness. So he was doing a lot of, because by that time, he had uh, gone through the period of the silent period. Then he worked a bit in, in sound pictures. He but worked he was a still... lot. He, he, he never stopped working, but he, had, he was no longer this worldwide star. He was one of the three or four most recognizable people in the world in the 20s. He made about nine of the great pictures and about uh, 20 of the shorts. And uh, it was a... Uh, you know, it was a phenomenon then, the, the, the four or five, Chaplin, Lloyd, and Mary Pickford, Doug Fairbanks, they were the most known people in the world. They could go anywhere in the world and, and be could taken in. Yeah, and, and that, that trademark uh, stone-faced look he had, it it's seemed to speak to everyone of, of just the, in stunned silence how, how we all respond to the world. He had that kind of a... Uh, 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 projection. Yes, that, was... that came from vaudeville. He had worked in the family act in vaudeville from the time he was five years old. And they were a rough act, a rough tumble act. Um, and Buster was called the human mop because the old man, they sewed a little uh, luggage handle in the back of his jacket and the old man would pick him up and throw him, just throw him against the in the wings and in the, against the wall, and if he hated the audience, he'd throw them at the audience. Jeez. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a very rough act. One time, they were called in in London, and uh, they were playing London. They were worldwide, and because uh, it was a silent act, you know, you could they could appear anywhere in the world and be understood as silent movies. That was the terrible thing when silent movies ended and they went into English and everybody, it limited the audience, mm. very much so. Wow, so what, what, did, uh, what type of things did he share with you? As a young actor, you must have been... Uh, well, I wasn't just... even that young at the time. <laughs> oh, oh I, I, yeah, 57, uh, uh, when you met him. Uh, but he must have... Because he was at the very beginning of the industry when it was, uh, gosh, barely, barely out of experimentation phase. The changes he must have seen uh, probably mirrored a lot what you've seen. You entered TV at four, in 1947. Mm -hmm. I think you worked with uh, Marlon Brando. My On stage in Streetcar Named Desire. Uh -huh. I was a stage actor. I did not do many movies 
until much later. I, I, I really loved the stage. And uh, I thought movies were a bastard art. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have, I, it wasn't that I didn't, I loved them, but I didn't think that it was the greatest way for an actor to perform, breaking up into scenes. And mm -hmm. I loved going to the theater and spending the whole night in, 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 that in, mode, in the yeah. progression of a play. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did not come out here until my wife and I, uh, we were working in, in a theater and uh, in summer, we, we had worked winter stock this winter of uh, 1975. And uh, we, it was a very expensive production. They couldn't book it for the summer. They just couldn't book enough places that could pay that much. Uh, the star of it was Werner Klemper, Colonel Klink. Does that name mean anything? Oh, yeah. Of, of uh, Hogan's Heroes. Right. So we broke down, and we, Alba and I had nothing to do for the summer. And a friend of ours, whom we had, uh, uh, I'd known all my life, and had come to New York in the winter, and had done a Playhouse 90 and had hired me and he was lonesome, he had just gotten a divorce. He said, please come on out, I got this big house, come on out. So we drove out thinking we'd have some fun for the summer and he took us immediately to uh, Hawaii for a Hawaii Five O, which he was directing. And we started, the two of us started to work. We never quite made it back to New York. Fascinating. But we had driven out expecting to drive back shortly thereafter. So that was in the 60s? No, 75. Oh, 75, that's right. So so uh, you were uh, getting involved in, uh, well, you did some films in the 60s. Um, yes, I did some rather memorable things, such as Frankenstein meets the space monster. He rides a Vespa <laughs> without a helmet, which is amazing. <laughs> Terrible picture, but it has legs. <laughs> you know, so many of those pictures were made for nothing. Uh, Frankenstein, which is always playing somewhere or, or being sold in a DVD, cost sixty-seven thousand dollars to make. Amazing! Amazing. Where, where was that? It was shot in Europe, or no, in uh, Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boy. So all through the. Uh, the 40s and 50s, you probably experienced a, a bit of the, the Red Scare and the, the communist... Uh, well, it was uh, certainly... Everybody did. I mean, because uh -huh. everybody who was working was being... Scrutinized. Scrutinized, and it was a terrible time because a lot of innocent people were really hurt badly. Mm. A lot of people ended up in, in England. They couldn't work in this country. And uh, it was a crazy time. Wow. I stayed in the theater all through that period. I, I worked constantly from after the war. I think streetcar was my first job after the war. And uh, it was such a hit, you know, and everybody in it started to work. Ah. And uh, it was just a, a wonderful period in the theater. There were, there were, there was uh, Arthur Miller, Tennessee Williams working. And uh, later on, of course, I worked with, uh, for Edward Albee, quite a bit. Uh, I was in some of his earlier plays, the one actors, and then I got into uh, my favorite play in the world uh, was Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, mm. which I played in New York and in London. And I just love that play. I think Edward's, I like Edward's work better than anybody else's. Yeah, because that, that was the big transition of acting styles, too, when, when uh, uh, the streetcar and the, uh, the method became very popular. Yeah, which uh, I got caught up with because we all joined the Actors Studio. Uh -huh. uh, 1947, the Actors Studio was formed. But I must say, and I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings, but I don't care. <laughs> uh, I, I disagreed with Strasberg, and I left the studio when he came in. The studio uh -huh. was originally formed by Bobby Lewis Kazan, a great, great director, and uh, he did Streetcar. And then they, were, they got busy, and other people began to come in and help, and then suddenly Strasberg was there, and I just hated what he took all the joy out of acting. 
Hmm. A lot of people loved him. Al Pacino thinks he's the greatest man in the world, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I was in a movie with Al, uh, the uh, Any Given Sunday, a football yeah. picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, Al was constantly saying, I don't understand why you, you didn't like because Strasburg and I said I just hated working with him joyless he said oh well I like to suffer <laughs> oh I see I see well, which I didn't I always thought acting and the theater and, and movies were should be a joyous experience oh isn't that the truth and that's yeah. probably something that, that Buster believed in as well oh Buster had think. a great time I mean you can yeah. see you know Buster didn't have a script he had an idea of a beginning and an end, and then he filled it in as he went along. When you're talking about Strasbourg, that's that's a, in the commentary of uh, Return of the Living Dead, the director, Dan O'Bannon, uh, described you as an external actor. I'm not Some sure. actors work from the inside out. I get an idea of what the character is like, and then I fill it in and would make it, uh, give it life, give it heart and, and muscle. But... Uh, but I like to think about what he's like uh, right at the top. Yeah, I mean, my favorite, my favorite move that that James does in this movie is when Frank cleans the top of the tank using the whole roll of paper <laughs> towel. It was like that's so brilliant. <laughs> it just spoke volumes about this guy. Um, but but Dan was saying that that uh, your your cohort Freddie was a method actor and you're external. Freddie had never acted in before in his life. <laughs> so I he Tommy <laughs> Tommy was just great. He was he was like a blank page. None of those kids had ever worked before, and but Tommy was just so wonderful. You would say something to me, and a lot of the movie is ad libbed, because strangely enough, usually when an author directs himself, he directs his own work. They listen for every single golden word that they wrote. And it can be, it can be a problem sometimes mm. with, you know, oh, wait a while, what did you say in that scene? But he allowed us to use it as a springboard, his wow. script. And lots of it, he had never directed a picture before. He didn't. He wasn't sure what he was doing. But what we did was we talked the producer, Tom Fox, into letting us rehearse for two weeks. And we set it up. I was sort of the senior member there, so they listened to me. And uh, we set it up as a stage play every day. And we would run through it. Literally, with the props and everything, we had a stage manager who set each scene up, and we ran through it in sequence mm. each day, like a play, so the kids who had never worked before had a sense of where they were. They had an emotional map, uh, which is... Which is you, which is what you have to do, but it sometimes takes a long time to get to know how to do that. So that because you're shooting scenes, you're shooting out the, of order, uh, out of order, and uh, suddenly you're shooting a scene where you're in telling somebody why you hate them, and you have no idea where you are unless you have worked that emotional map. Even in any movie that I do, I do a, a map. An emotional map. I have. I have a code. For you color code the pages of the script, or no? I, I no. I I just sort of make notes. Ah, numbers. I think the Marx Brothers did that as well. They would before they would shoot their movies. They would make a play of it and see how they, they would responded. Go out and do it and, to they the, would go out and do it in vaudeville. Vaudeville was a great thing because it. Uh, a lot of actors trained in vaudeville. And even later on, actors like the Marx Brothers went out and vaudeville was over by that time, pretty much. But they would go to a theater and, and just say, listen, uh, we want to do an act in between them. The, they used to have double features. And mm -hmm. they would do the act in between the two features, 
Wow. Can you describe a little bit, I, I'm not sure where the, the contract players of the studio, uh, if that was in existence uh, or how long that, that was, uh, an idea of what it was like to, to be a contract player in a studio and how it transitioned into where we are now, where, where actors are just kind of free, independent. You know, I, I always thought to be working steadily was important because it's a muscle that you got to use. And loads of actors would not would go for years without working and then get another job. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, I thought how marvelous to be under contract. And at the Players Club in New York, uh, which is a club I belonged to for many, many years, uh, Cagney, Jim Cagney, Frank McHugh, that crowd of guys from the, who were under contract, the Irish Mafia, who were under contract at Warner Brothers, uh, they were now retired, but they used to come around and talk about things. And they always said, oh, those goddamn Warner Brothers, they made us work so hard. Frank McHugh said once, I did 35 movies in one year. He said, I was working sometimes <laughs> five different movies in the same day. They would take him by car, with somebody who would say, this is what it's about at this point, and then they would get him into costume, and he would do the scene, and then they would move him to another another scene. Wow. And they did work hard, but I thought it was wonderful, but they all hated it. And of course, the the bosses were were not benevolent. Wow, so that, so when that petered out was about, what, mid-50s? Well, or? It, it petered out, what happened was, it was a it was a governmental thing. I mean, they were making everybody was making money hand over fist because the studios owned their own theaters, mm -hmm. so they produced all these movies. You know, a studio like Warner Brothers was probably doing seventy five, eighty five pictures a year, and they had all these people under counter. They kept them working, and they did work hard, but they worked. Mm -hmm. I mean, loads of actors that I knew in New York went. Got a job every three or four years. I don't know. They were working working as waiters and stuff. So uh, it was it was a, a difficult thing to conjure that you were going to be under contract and owned by these people by the by the, mm. the studios. But on the other hand, the work was just wonderful. Right. And then, of course, the unions came in. Well, that was in the 30s. Oh, well, what I started to say, excuse yeah. me, Mark. I started. Sure. The fact was that the, the government clamped down and said it was an, a, a, an antitrust thing. And they stopped, they made the studios sell the theaters. You know, you see Warner Brothers Theater, uh, there's still one downtown. Uh, they had their own names, the studio names on the theaters. So what happened was they lost, they lost a great amount of income. They had to distribute their pictures through other people's theaters, and they began to get pan They panicked. It was around 1948, and they really panicked, and they they began to save money by dismissing actors and no more contracts. And for a while, there were still actors who were under contract. But uh, what happened was the inmates took over the asylum. <laughs> the actors began to work. they become stars. They were freelance. They could ask for as much as they could possibly get. Actors, those days, the biggest stars, like Gable, I mean, got astronomical figures, $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, a week. I mean, it was astronomical mm -hmm. during the Depression. Oh, my God. So when... Multiply most, that by 10, right? Well, most people, most people were, you know, making $15, $25 a week. My father, I think, was getting $15 a week all through the 30s. So then actors were getting percentages, and pretty soon actors were making... Two and three million dollars a picture, sometimes twenty million on a big hit. So it was a it was a big change. After all these periods, uh, 
what what would be your favorite decade in the business? There's a question. No, I wish I had worked. I I I, I wish I'd been working in silent movies with people like Buster. Uh, I mean, I I still I love silent movies. I just I just think they're so beautiful to watch, and not listen to all that jabber, and uh, or screaming. First, hmm? no, screaming. Screaming. <laughs> screaming. Well, first of all, I'm I'm very disappointed in what's happened to movies. Uh, you know, the the studios may have been difficult, but they turned out some great films. Does it, uh, do people watch Turner Classic Movies? Mm -hmm. It's the only thing I watch anymore because I think the movies are so great, the old movies. And I, I don't know, I, I'm a member of the Academy and I, I see every picture to, each year to vote. But I don't see very much I like. And I'm sick and tired of computer generated crap. I mean, it's just, it's just run. I mean, it just goes against the beauty of the human body and the human spirit to have all that stuff. I, I think there's a, uh, a sentiment, especially among uh, makeup artists, creature effects artists, I think there are things that human beings like to do. They like to be on stages. They like to perform with other people. Yes. They like to be in sets. And the computer has taken that away. I don't think actors are in their element when they're in green rooms. You mean green, the green screen. screen. <laughs> 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 but uh, I, I think people want to make art the way they want to make it and not have it dictated by technology, uh, in my opinion. And I think that's where you're going with this, too. It's, it's a people uh, art. I agree. Yeah. I agree. And that's why, that's why I love the silent movies, the black and white movies, uh, uh, are, are just, they have people. And, you know, what they can do with the green screen and with the computers is exciting, and it's, uh, but it's, there's no heart in most of it. Mm. No I think, heart. I think Orson Welles uh, said about his black and white films, keep your crayons off of my movie. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't care for that much. So you won the Buster Award, and it was because you demonstrated professional excellence in the tradition of Buster Keaton. What does that mean to you? What is the tradition of excellence that Buster brought? What should uh, our Buster fellow Buster said, learn? and it's an interview, you see it sometimes on, uh, I think uh, Kevin Brownlow used yeah. it in the... Uh, in the uh, uh, hard act to follow. Wonderful documentary, you should all see that. Yeah, Kevin Brownlow's documentary, the 13 hours of Hollywood, the early years, are really brilliant. They're hard to find, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I don't, I think they're bootlegged because they never, he never could get all the rights to all these movies uh, for, a, for a DVD. I see. So, but they are bootlegged and people have them. Uh, you can get them, and uh, <laughs> and uh, that period, uh, which Kevin did so well, he also wrote a book which everybody should really read, called "The Parades Gone By." Mm -hmm. It's one of the best books on film you'll ever get your mitts on, and uh, Kevin's made a lot of documentaries. I often work with him. I did one on Buster. It's called uh, So Funny It Hurts. It's about the five years at MGM. Oh. And they, where they ruined him. They, they, Buster went there as one of the most, as I said before, most recognizable men or woman in the world. And five years later, he was unemployable. They destroyed his career. They wouldn't let him work the way he worked. They wanted every day to be itemized and the the bookkeeping and this mm. and buster buster used to come in and put his day's shoot list on on a, an envelope he'd find his he'd find an, a mail in his mail he'd take an envelope and just write what they were going to shoot that day and that even that changed depending upon what developed in the in the shooting 
It was free and wonderful. Mm. And all that stopped the day the, the, day the laughter stopped. Uh, the bookkeepers took over. Yeah. Yes. Buster owned his own studio, as many of them did. Chaplin, Lloyd, the Fairbanks, Fairbanks and Mary, uh, Mary Pickford. And then gradually, and, and gradually it became a, biz a big business. Not that they weren't doing well. So that well, yeah, that's true. But that 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 excellence that uh, that you're speaking of is um, that constant creativity, the refinement. That was stopped the thing. by the studios insisting on everything being according to a book, mm. a bookkeeper's book. Right. Right. Boy. Well, do you have, before we turn it over to the audience, I'm sure they're, they're loaded with questions. There's so many. Uh, actually, why don't we do that now? Do, uh, is there a question in the <coughs> audience here? I'm sure there is. How many Pathmark commercials did you make? Well, somebody said 5,000. I actually did closer to 12,000. We, <laughs> <did, laughs> we, did, we did 10 a week for 28 years. Wow. Oh, my goodness. That's why my wife has all those diamonds all over. <laughs> oh, did we pawn those again? <laughs> and you had yeah. one? Um, everybody in this room knows uh, how hard it is to get into this business. I think we, we know. Yeah. And uh, like you said, there's a lot of crap right now on TV. So um, sometimes we get the feeling that talent is not enough to get in, to be a, a working successful actor. So what would you say are some uh, things that you need as an actor to, to, to be just uh, a working actor? Like um, maybe luck? Um, I don't know. Uh, well, being sometimes it is just being in the right place at the right time. But I think the greatest training for an actor in movies is to work on stage. I would suggest to any actor who wants to be an actor, movies, television, stage, is to find a little company of actors and work with them uh, and, and, and uh, in front of an audience. You know, find, you, know uh, you get an audience and uh, I think that's by far the best thing. And, and luck and perseverance. Also, to find some way to earn a living that doesn't interfere with your going to look for work and, and working. But, you know, unless, unless you got mama and papa who are very nicely wealthy, uh, it's tough. Uh, I struggled constantly. I had struggled constantly to uh, make a living. And uh, even, even when I was a little bit more successful than at the beginning. You have bad periods, inescapable bad periods, and you've got to weather them and somehow not make yourself, not leave yourself unavailable for the main event. Wow. What did you do in those dry periods? I understand you worked on cars or something? Yeah, I, I restored automobiles. I had an antique shop for a while. Because uh, I, I did all things I loved, but I was my own boss. So that if my agent called and said, can you get down to so-and-so? So, yeah, wash my hands and get the grease, clean my fingernails and go off and do it. That helps. Yes, sir. I've got to ask what it was like to work with Marlon Brando. Who? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That guy in the play. Oh, Marlon. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was illuminating. I mean, you know, up until Marlon, all of us young actors were in awe of John Barrymore. And we, we worked, we, we thought the speech of Barrymore's was perfect. We all talked like that. My liege, I do not I know prisoners, but I remember when the fight was lost. And then Brando came along. And I remember, I was in all the rehearsals, of course. I was an assistant stage manager. I did not go, 
originate the part of the young collector. I was an assistant stage manager, and I was the understudy. And about 10 weeks after the play opened, he got sick and never came back. And I started to play, and Kazan said, came to see me, and he said, well, I said, all right, you're a little old for the part, which I was. As a 17-year-old boy, I'd already been through a war. I was 25. And uh, he said, you, you can get away with it. He said, do you want to play? I said, yes. It was 15 bucks more a week. I would have done anything for 15 <laughs> bucks more a week. And uh, so I played it. And then I went on the road uh, with Anthony Quinn, which was a wonderful, uh, uh, he was a wonderful performer and a wonderful uh, Stanley. And uh, what was the question? Oh, oh did I like working with Marlon? Yeah, it was an illumination because suddenly in the rehearsals, uh, you couldn't understand a word he said. <laughs> and uh, audiences were rather shocked by it. a lot of mumbling and stuff. But the performance was so brilliant, you had to look past what you couldn't hear. You could, you got other things. Uh, Almost like a silent movie. You can't understand him. You, the audience brings a lot more to the performance. That's right. That's right. But he was just so brilliant that you couldn't take your eyes off him. There was a moment, the end of the first act, the fourth scene, when Stella and Blanche are in the bedroom. Does everybody know what the set looked like? It was a, a ramshackle, a, a low-budget uh, New Orleans apartment. And uh, there was a, a bedroom here, then the kind of living room kitchen here, and the bathroom off the bedroom. And that was it. And they... So at one point, Marl oh, and there was a scrim in the back that would light up. You could see th the city going on behind it. There were things going on behind the scrim when they wanted, Kazan directed it brilliantly, and it was a brilliant set. So at one point, in the end of the, as I said, the end of the first act, the fourth scene, Stella and Blanche are over here, and Blanche is tearing Marlon apart, Stanley apart. She's saying, you know, Stella, Stella for Star, how can you, how can you live with this animal? He's, a, he's an animal. He, he eats like an animal, and she's tearing him apart. In the meantime, the lights come up as Stanley crosses the back of the scrim, carrying a, a, a bowling ball. And he walks around, and there, there's a little step up, and a louvered door, and he opens the door, walks in, turns his back to the audience, opens the refrigerator, not refrigerator, the ice box, which is in the, the, the main room, puts the bowling ball down, and reaches in for a beer, and as he's pulling the beer out, he hears her talking about him critically, and she goes on and on. But the audience had crossed came back into the room with him, watched him open the icebox, and never took their eyes off him. He stood stock still. He didn't move a muscle in his back. And Jessica Tandy, who was playing uh, uh, the part of, uh, of uh, Blanche and Kim Hunter, it drove them crazy. And Jessica would say, Jimmy, because I was still assistant stage manager, I still want. She said, he's got to be doing something because the, the, their eyes are right on him. They don't come back to this beautiful speech. And uh, I would dutifully go out, watch it, and Marlon just stood there with a beer in his hand but never moved. And I would report to her. I'd go to the dressing room and I'd say, I'm awfully sorry, he's not doing anything. And she said, God. God. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing. I mean, it was just that. And I remember Kazan saying, well, when I do the movie, uh, Jesse, I, I'm, I'll be able to keep the camera away from him. Mm. Didn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work. If you watch the movie, you'll see the same thing. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what was it like to work with Anthony Quinn? <laughs> well, 
He was a totally different actor, but serious. And I liked him very much because he never stopped working. As a matter of fact, during rehearsal, one day he stopped the rehearsal and he started to scream at the other actors and he said, God damn it, he said, I'm Anthony Quinn! You're adjusting to me as though I'm like, Brando! Adjust to me, Anthony Quinn! And I loved him for that, that he was, and he was right, they were. And from then on, it sort of changed a little, and they watched him. And uh, hundreds of performances. He came off the stage one night after a scene, and I was in the light box with the light, checking that there was a light that wasn't quite right. And he came off, and he said, you see what I did in that scene, Jimmy? I said, no, I'm sorry, Anthony. I was, I was doing, a, doing something. He said, grab me. He said, I'm out there acting all the time. God damn it, watch me. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean when you say the other actors were adjusting to they were, They were still playing as though they were working with, with Marlon. And, and they were, Tony and Marlon were quite different in the performance. Oh, oh, I see. That <laughs> it was like a consistent troupe, and then uh, it swapped yes, out. And yeah, they, oh, yeah, I see. Yeah, I see. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were both wonderful. Tony got better and better. He started out a little rough. He'd had a bad time, you know. He was finished in Hollywood. He'd been blacklisted by Cecil B. DeMille, his father-in-law, because of something that happened, which I won't go into here. Uh, <laughs> But DeMille hated him and said, I'm going to break you. He mm -hmm. was married to Catherine DeMille, DeMille's uh, adopted daughter. Beautiful woman, a wonderful woman. And uh, Tony, couldn't, Tony couldn't get a job. Mm -hmm. And he was doing very well at the time, up to that point. And uh, he went to New York desperately to see if he... He'd get into something. He got into a show called A Gentleman from Athens. Mm -hmm. One night, ran one night and closed. But Irene Selznick went to see it. She knew somebody else of the producer. She was the producer of Streetcar. And she went to see it. And she, she was, they were trying to get somebody to replace Marlon. Nobody wanted it. It was an invidious, nobody wanted the invidious comparison. I mean, all the, every big actor, they, act, they offered it to, I remember Garfield. Garfield was offered it originally and turned it down. But nobody wanted to go into that part, but Tony was desperate. And he took it. And his whole life changed. Hmm. What was the difference in what they did with the part? Marlon was more internal. Marlon was quieter. Tony was loud and noisy in the part. And uh, just bigger. Marlon was... When Marlon did something like pull the tablecloth, it was unusual because most of the time he was quiet, like an animal in, in a crouch position. And when he did something, it was extraordinary. Uh, Tony was... Big and noisy the whole time. <laughs> it was him. He was a big, noisy guy. Talented. Very talented. I think one of the best movie performances I've ever seen is La Strada. The strong man. He's the strong man with Juliette Messina. Yeah, of course. Isn't it La Strada? Yes. My God, that's a great performance. Wow. Oh. In, in, in your career, there are certain actors that like to uh, maintain the character even off camera throughout the... Uh... I understand, and I respect them if they want to do it, but I must say, uh, if, you, if you have to do that, it's, it's, it's boring, and I don't think you know how to... For me, I mean, I, I know if I'm... If I'm good in a part, I've prepared right, I have it, and I can walk off 
and have a, a beer and have a lot of laughs and and get right back in. Get it. back in, yeah, because I'm, I know I've I've done my preparation, but some actors really. I won't mention their names because I hate them. They do it. <laughs> <laughs> there must be more questions out there. The movie we watched, I felt you were quite physical in the role. Do you prefer doing physical roles? Does that help you? Yeah, I do. Uh, I was a dancer uh, originally. Uh, when I went to the neighborhood playhouse before the war, I went in 1940 and until 41, until the war started. And I, Martha Graham was the dance teacher there. They, they mixed dance, speech, and, and acting. It was a wonderful school. The Neighborhood Playhouse was the best acting school in the country for my money. I don't know what it's like now, but then it was, uh, the American Academy was sort of a finishing school. Uh -huh. But uh, Martha um, picked me up for her company. And that summer I worked, uh, at, uh, in her company, and I like dancing. And then, uh, but I, when I came back after the war, she said, "You, you, you missed the boat. It's too late." So uh, huh. she said, "But you're lucky. You'll have a, you'll be an actor, be an actor, and have a longer career." Because dan dancers, we have a niece, a marvelous girl, Aviva, uh, who's just a beautiful, beautiful girl, and a great dancer. But she, she said. I'm, we're in pain all the time, and dancers are in pain. She's, I don't know whether you saw Super Bad. She, uh, she was the uh, girl who got, what was his name at the end? Alba? Um, mix, what's mix somebody or other? Yeah. She was the butt thong girl. What? The butt thong. The butt thong girl, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't Come like on. to say that in front of her grandmother. <laughs> But she's a wonderful girl and a good actress. <laughs> I can ask another thing. Okay, please. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Only one of them. Uh, putting all the uh, puzzles, uh, pieces of the puzzle together that you've been saying, is there like an actress or an actor right now, young, or that you really admire, or that, that you really have learned mm -hmm. a lot from watching them on film? Like, I don't know, a young actress, young actor? Uh, yes. I think Jennifer Lawrence is superb. Uh, Jessica Chastain, yeah. uh, actress. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the younger actors, uh, Brian Cranston. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's right there, isn't he? And there are a lot of really good actors working, I think. Uh, I don't think they're connected with Strasbourg either. <laughs> <laughs> what was the worst experience you ever had working in a film? Just the worst experience you ever had. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Uh, geez, that's a tough question. I mean, even... Ava, can you remember me coming home complaining and <laughs> drinking a little too much? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I, I can, but I don't really think it's very political <laughs> to bring it up. Uh, <laughs> okay. With another actor? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, I don't want to knock them. No, no. But there are a lot of a lot of. Jim can have fun doing trashy, trashy stuff. You know, he, he really kind of led the team on return yeah. mm -hmm. because he just he just loved the whole experience and I think uh, you know if if you enjoy the work as he does uh, you know even an experience which may not be totally great can be fun can be fun yeah I understand you were on the set even when you weren't needed you you would uh, if it wasn't your shoot day you'd actually be on the set of return to, to root them well, all if Lynette qu if 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 Quigley, <laughs> if Quigley was around, you'd be there too. <laughs> By the way, she's a darling girl, um, and it was a tough picture for her. She was wet all the time, cold and wet, and uh, she was she's really she was very modest, and uh, we always had somebody with a with a blanket for her, and uh, I, I she was an, a, a nice girl to work with. 
Wow, that that is it's surprising that that you say she was modest. Very it, modest. Watching that performance, and then so when she turned it off, it was like she just sort of uh, became a more. Uh, oh yes, she demure. was just no. She was a she. It was, it was a professional thing. She was a professional dancer. Uh, uh, I. Th uh, I think in a strip club. It was, but that was the way she made her living. She was a beautiful dancer mm -hmm. and a beautiful body. I don't blame her for showing it. <laughs> yeah, I've never been asked to show mine, but I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, younger people sometimes don't appreciate what they have. I think, but um, the uh, uh, you have it, flaunt it. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Uh, what do you re recollect about your uh, um, uh, Mr. Coltenburner or uh, the the actor who played the uh, the mortician? Oh, Don Kalfa. Yes. When Don calls, I know I'm in trouble for an hour of listening to absolute crazy talk. <laughs> he's a he's a nice guy, he's a charming guy, but he's uh, and he's a wonderful actor. Uh, he's done. He did, I think, those Weekends with Bernie pictures. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Remember, he's very funny in them. But he's not of this world. <laughs> <laughs> he lives up in the desert. He's, he's, a, he's an oddball, but he's a very nice guy. Just, uh, I always, come home, when I come home, when Ob and I come home, we hear on the answering machine. Hello, Rinky Dinks! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it really seemed to be a perfect cast. I mean, everyone just fit in so nicely in that. Yeah, they did, and uh, it, it, it just, everything coalesced. And uh, Mark, part of it was Dan, who had never directed before and was interested in what we did, by the way, when we rehearsed every day, Dan filmed it and then went home at night and watched it all night. Fascinating. And which he learned, that's how he learned to direct. I mean, because it, 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 it looks like it's directed by a seasoned actor. It's hard to imagine that this was his first. Well, he was so sensible. He, he gave us free reign to, uh, I mean, so much of it is ad lib. You know, moment to moment, Adelaide, which is what the method is about, is about moment to moment. You you uh, keep, you're aware of everything that's going around and you adjust to it and make changes. That's right. And you studied uh, after Sanford Meisner as well. You knew him. Sandy? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was crazy. Man. He's the best teacher I ever had oh. by far. And uh, he then he took over the actor's studio for a while, too. That was... Uh, and I, I loved it when he was there. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing, all these things. I, uh, we should probably take maybe one more question. Yeah. What did you learn from Sandy? What's the, the greatest thing you took away from Sandy? The moment-to-moment -moment thing of knowing where you came from when you walk on stage, where you came from, where you're going, and what you want. You've got to want things. That's your drive. Sandy was very simple, very simple, and great, uh, great um, exercises. Fantastic. <laughs> Robert, do we have a, you know, we want to thank you so much for appearing with well, us. Well, thank you we for coming. I, I, I,